Some of the hardest problems in the world exist far above the planet. Our job, to launch the smartest solutions, to protect our satellites, clean up our clutter, to propel breakthroughs in propulsion, to learn more about our place in the universe, to outpace emerging threats. Every day, the Aerospace Corporation uses the latest technologies to ensure our nation's safety and leadership in space. Welcome to the Space Policy Show. We have a fantastic episode for you today. As usual, please ask your questions using hashtag the Space Policy Show on Twitter or comment in the Vimeo video box below. We would love to hear from you. We are at episode 20. This is a milestone and it is a very timely topic. We are talking about a new era of commercial remote sensing with Jamie Morin and Robert Cardillo. A little bit about Jamie Morin. So Dr. Jamie Morin is the executive director of the Center for Space Policy and Strategy, which provides objective analysis and comprehensive research to ensure well-informed, technically defensible, and forward-looking space policy. Without further ado, I'd like to kick it over to Jamie. He will be introducing Robert. Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here today on the Space Policy Show and to be joined by Robert Cardillo, one of the nation's most distinguished intelligence professionals. Robert's been a real mainstay of the geospatial intelligence world, um, well known for his leadership of NGA, but really culminating a career of almost 35 years working in the intelligence community. Uh, today, he is an independent consultant and works to advise a wide variety of companies and organizations and does some teaching and scholarship on the side. So we're really excited to have him to talk about how the world is changing, or maybe more precisely, how the observed world is changing in this period where satellites and other sensors are producing enormous amounts of data. And the capability of various systems and algorithms to absorb that data, analyze it and make actionable sense of it is growing extraordinarily. So we're delighted to have you today, Robert. Um, we're really delighted to hear your thoughts about some of these changes that are underway. And you know, frankly, you're you're responsible for some of these changes. You you were at the helm when some of the key enabling choices were made. Uh, what my colleague at the Aerospace Corporation Center for Space Policy and Strategy, Joseph Kohler, called uh, a geoint singularity that's emerging has a lot to do with the uh, trends that have occurred on both the government, but perhaps even more importantly, commercial side. So can I ask you to Tell us a little bit about how you watched during your professional career the role of uh, commercial satellite imagery and other sources of data from satellites change. Sure. And um, let me start by thanking you, Jamie. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity to, uh, to have this discussion, which is, um, I think, necessary for us to make the most of what I see are some great opportunities. Um, and I appreciate that kind introduction. Uh, I did hang on the word mainstay. I guess there is a certain quality to quantity, right? And I, I, I did hang around for a long time. And I want to use my career perhaps to frame our conversation. So, Jamie, when I was fortunate enough to be invited into uh, the profession, broadly speaking, of intelligence, but I was trained as a photographic interpreter. Uh, ultimately became an imagery analyst and then uh, the head of the geospatial intelligence agency. Uh, but when I was invited in in the, in the early 80s, uh, one, we wouldn't be having this conversation in any way, shape or form. Uh, the, the profession was highly classified, highly compartmentalized and highly protected. And it was a government owned and operated uh, entity, a monopoly. Mm. When I departed uh, NGA a little over a year ago, um, clearly the government is a major player, and I suspect we'll talk about its role uh, today and tomorrow. 
But the really, the, as you said in your intro, what is different today is this vibrant, innovative, and um, really instructive component called commercial uh, imagery. And it really is the crossover of those two uh, experiences that I had that really shaped uh, my tenure as director and what helped me to try to um, make the most of the opportunity for an entity like NGA. And so again, we're, the transition continues, uh, the innovations continue, uh, but the opportunities continue to present themselves. Mm. You know, one of the things I observed during my time with the Department of Defense was there was a what I might call an inherent conservatism, especially when the DOD and the IC get together on uh, regulatory or policy issues. Right. We not surprisingly. Right. We have a really strong uh, national security position. We've enjoyed. Uh, decades of predominance in major areas of technology. Uh, and so there's a tendency to kind of protect uh, sources and methods, certainly, but also uh, technology bases of power and to try and keep things uh, centered in on the government. Did you how did you see that sort of um, approach to issues change during your tenure in leadership? Um, in a word, slowly, slowly, um, deliberately, um, mm -hmm. for every reason you just said. I mean, if you're if you're a member of the national security team, uh, your tolerance for risk is going to be pretty low, meaning you, you don't want any. And when you're presented with a pending license for a commercial provider to be able to image the planet at certain resolutions or times of day, mm -hmm. et cetera, your first reaction is no, no, don't, don't need that because that could expose A, B, or C, or that could add risk to you know, operational movements, et cetera. So you're right, there is a kind of a natural tendency within that world to say no. Um, I, and I suspect we might want to talk about it some more, Jamie, but I was enthused with the recent um, release of the new licensing regulations that Commerce and NOAA uh, put out because it does, I think, properly recognize that Yes, there always is a balance between what you can and should share versus what could um, create a business or commercial opportunity for a U.S. company. But um, the reality is, is that, and this is not a new reality, uh, the world is involved in this. And, um, you know, I, you know in dozens of countries can put capabilities into space. And so what I what I most appreciate, I think, about the new commercial imaging licensing regulations is that they one, they they recognize that reality. And so if there is a foreign capability to remotely sense the planet at a certain capability, that will be allowed for a US company to pursue uh, and to operate at that same capability. And to me, it, it, I think it properly also shifts the onus. In those days that you described in the Pentagon, I, th I thought of companies, they actually had to come in, they came in the door guilty, and they had to prove their innocence. Uh, you know, they had, to, they had to take away all risk uh, in order to get the license. Now I'm exaggerating a little bit, but that was kind of the mindset. And now it's, it's really flipped. The government is saying, look, we know the world is... Uh, full of more and more sensing, and we want U.S. industry to be competitive in such a world. And the message to my colleagues, our colleagues, Jamie, back in defense and intelligence is, you need to learn how to be successful in a more transparent world. My bumper sticker at NGA was find a way to succeed in the open. Uh, that was to my workforce there. But in many ways, I would give the same counsel to my colleagues in the Defense Department. Sure. I mean, 
it strikes me that the innovations are occurring in a whole bunch of dimensions simultaneously, right? You've got uh, increasing spatial resolution, you've got increasing spectral resolution to include things outside of, you know, optical altogether, radio frequency uh, observation on the commercial side now. Um, you've also got a dramatic increase in temporal resolution. Um, revisit rate and frequency, uh, you know, frequency of observation. Um, so a lot of new um, factors where people planning out some sort of operation, whether nefarious or otherwise, are going to really have to presume they're observed. Um, and then that's a <clears throat> that's not an impossible thing to train for, but it's a different thing, I think, than what we've uh, historically how we've historically approached it. Um, do you have any thoughts on that operational side for sort of the rest of the national security community? And then I think we could turn to a little bit more of what's going on on the commercial side and where you see those developments taking us. Yes. So, I mean, to me, well, let me take a step back. So I'm a big believer that the reason our nation has an intelligence community is to deliver advantage. And if we're not delivering advantage to a decision maker, we're not doing our job. And so uh, 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 I hope a clear way to think about that advantage is we scan horizons, we detect, we identify, and we assess threats on the horizon, and we present them to a decision maker before the event dictates, before, you know, something bad happens. Okay, so that's... That's the calculus, uh, and all for the sake of this exchange, I'll use that as that's the way it was, that's the way it is, and that's the way it will be. Now, we could debate that, but for this, I'm going to say that that's <laughs> remained consistent. Within such a world, um, there are different ways to create advantage. I talked about one of them in the 80s. Have something no one else has. Have a way to see something that no one else can see. Um, that is clearly advantage, and 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 sure, if if somehow we could recover that kind of you know uh, increment of of capability, then we should. But with the flattening of technology, with the expansion of capability, with the reduced barriers to space broadly, uh, you're correct that. Uh, both the spectrum, so not just electro-optical, but synthetic aperture radar. You mentioned radio frequencies, think infrared or shortwave infrared, hyperspectral. I call that spreading across the spectrum. And you also mentioned the clock, the temporal resolution. You have to cover the clock. Um, again, you know, when I was doing my analysis of the Soviet Union, because that was the that was the adversary and that was the priority intelligence target, I had to infer information from visually identifying items of interest in the Soviet Union, either at 10 o'clock in the morning local or 2 p.m. in the afternoon local. And that's just the way the orbits worked in those days. And I called those blinks. You know, I got to blink at the target yeah. a couple of times. Well, that's a whole lot of time you have to fill in. <laughs> between blinks. And again, don't get me wrong, that was a great time and a great advantage because of the uniqueness of our capability. But now, when you think of operating where there are, you know, how do I want to say this? There are, the, 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 the eye is, is blinking less because it's staring more. It's seeing at night, sensing at night. And it's it's able to infer insight through spectral recognition that just didn't exist before. Mm -hmm. That that that's transparency, or as Joseph uh, might have said, you know, uh, singularity. So, the, but but remember what I said: the advantage is still what you're seeking. So you have to find a different way to to create advantage. Mm -hmm. And I would argue to my friends in the intel community and colleagues at Defense. It's really going to be more about concepts of operation, um, relationships, uh, partnerships, um, 
procedures, uh, to mental models that perhaps we got stuck in that need to be revisited. So um, long way to say we, we, we need to be better uh, in, in relatively the same you know, technological space. It's a different challenge, uh, for sure, and it's one, like I said, that we we strove to achieve during my tenure at NGA. But uh, it's a continual struggle because once you, uh, I used to use the term, there's no coasting. Once you once you mm-hmm. think you've you're 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 where you need to be, all of a sudden the adversary or the competitor is catching up on uh, quickly. Let me let me pull you back for a moment to your tenure at NGA. And mm-hmm. one of the things that you did during that time there is you transitioned the role of being the intelligence community's buyer of commercial imagery uh, from NGA to NRO. Can you talk a little bit about that decision and and the why behind it and and how you saw it playing out? Sure. um, Once again, I think you need to go back a little bit in time because one could and should ask the question, why was NGA acquiring commercial imagery from mm. the nation when you could think of that as as an NRO mission because of its acquisition role and its provision of imagery for the nation uh, responsibility. Uh, I wasn't in the room when that original decision was made, but I was near the room. And my understanding was that um, there was concern in the mid-aughts, so think you know, 2006, seven timeframe that the commercial imagery industry, I'll say it was in its infancy. We could argue about, you know, when it began, et cetera, but it was still, let's, let's, let's agree. It was immature uh, in that timeframe that perhaps, uh, perhaps it would be better to have the user of that imagery be the steward for that contract vehicle and the relationship with those immature uh, commercial imagery companies uh, versus what some might have thought of as a competitor. You know, mm. there's a there's a national, uh, you know, a collection of imagery. That's what you know that we think of NRO and providing, and there's commercial, and so maybe the two don't fit well together. That they would actually could work at odds. Um, right or wrong, that decision was made, and that contract, uh, known as Enhanced View, was initiated. Um, uh, 2008, 2009, awarded to two companies uh, that existed at the time, GOI and Digital Globe. Uh, those companies eventually merged and then into Digital Globe, and then Digital Globe is now known or reincorporated as Maxar. Um, so uh, if we go back to 2018, uh, my boss at the direct, as the Director of National Intelligence, Jim Clapper, my colleague, the director of NRO, Betty Sapp, and I began to discuss about um, what the nation needed uh, on the other side of Enhanced View. Enhanced View was a 10-year contract um, executed in uh, single-year options. So each year we made a decision about whether to continue. And we were coming up on the option year in 2018. And we were thinking that, look, when we uh, succeed, when we decide what we want to do as a government on the, after the end of Enhanced View in two more years, uh, perhaps it's time to align the acquisition of government imagery with the acquisition of commercial imagery. Mm-hmm. And there was there was an architectural relationship uh, uh, rationale for this. There was there was uh, a, an efficiency uh, uh, rationale for this. Uh, there was processing; all the imagery had to be processed, etc. And so we agreed that it was time to do so, uh, or thought it was time to do so. Obviously, we have conversations with Capitol Hill, who gets a vote on these types of things. It's a very large contract; it's a very big decision. And so what we decided to do was to amend the memorandum of agreement that existed between NRO and NGA. And I would say that it wasn't a huge change because it really just clarified the following. It said that NRO's responsibility is, is acquisition of source 
So mm. think of a pixel. They get the pixels. And GA's responsibility is to turn those pixels into information, you know, or maps or charts or data or analysis. And you might say, well, of course it is. That's that's why we have those two agencies. And we thought so as well. Mm-hmm. That was clarified within the MOA. Betty and I re-signed it. And then we decided, look, um, we don't need to wait two years. We can transfer it now. We don't uh, need to. Uh, I mean, there were some contractual things that needed to be done to it. But but why not get the ramp up so that NRO is ready for the recompete, et cetera. And, and we can talk more about it, but I think NRO has done a great job with some of their test contracts and evaluation contracts that they're now letting to try to better understand what the capabilities are out there in the commercial market. So uh, it was a longish answer to your short question, uh, Jamie, but I do think there's a lot behind it. And I, and I realize people, uh, you know, wanted to know what, what was behind the decision. And I, and I tried to give that historic context and then the reality we faced in 2018. Yeah. Yeah. As a former cost and budget guy, one of the things I always watch for is uh, when is the government buying something pretending it's commercial? Um, You know, if, if the government is the primary buyer of something, the, Um, certainly if they're the only, a a monopsonist buyer, as an economist would say, Um, but even if they're just the preponderance of the market, uh, often a lot of the things that we assume would work in a free market break down. Um, You had the case certainly with, at the outset of Enhanced View and some of the previous experimental type things where government was a big, big player um, we're certainly evolving to a much more diverse market in imagery and in other satellite sensing. Um, but how do you see the government's role strategically in those cases where a government decision to buy something like this from a private company might be the make or break decision for that private company, um, whether or not they can close their business plan and cover their cost of capital? Um, I'll get quickly in over my head and you can economically throw me a, a life raft or watch me sink here, Jamie, but here's my view. Uh, look, the, the government via the president initiated a policy in a national security policy directive NSPD 27. And that policy directive said essentially the following. It is in this country's interest in our national interest to not just have a vibrant commercial imagery industry, but to lead, to be the world's leader in that. So that was the policy decision. Um, The budgetary decision, right, the monetization decision, the appropriation decision to say that the U.S. government was going to spend roughly $3 billion over 10 years to procure commercial imagery was, in my mind, directly tied to NSPD 27. Mm. Okay, we're going to take tax dollars. We're going to appropriate them. We are going to compete them, which was done via the initial enhanced view. And and we will be the predominant buyer, to your point. Uh, I think the government did that with the eyes wide open um, and, uh, and, and literally created, I'll say a market, you might disagree with that term, that, that, was uh, probably, well, why not drop the probably? I, I would argue would not have existed without, right? So it was, it was government created market and there's probably some term for that. But, <laughs> um, going forward, and, and, and let me quickly say too, I would argue that, that the U.S. taxpayer got a great return on mm. that investment. Uh, 90% of the NGA mapping, charting, geodetic mission was fueled by that contract. So worldwide navigation, transportation, air, land, sea, et cetera. Uh, I think the country got a good deal. Now, I'm sure there's others who would say uh, differently. But again, I I don't think it was just let's give money to a couple of commercial companies. 
uh, there was huge value. T to your point, um, today, I do agree it's different. I, and look, uh, I think the market's at work as we speak. Uh, I don't think we know today what the market is outside of the government. I mean, I, again, I'm out of government, so I, I can't speak to what the government's decision will be on the backside of this enhanced view contract. Uh, I'd be surprised if it wasn't, didn't continue to be in that market. But clearly there are other players now. And um, look, you, you know, you mentioned uh, radio frequency. So the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the first mover there was a company called Hawkeye 360. Um, and I like to at least envision the following story. Um, I picture a Hawkeye 360 executive with a folder, right, a manila folder, wandering the halls of the Commerce Department, looking for where they would submit their license request to collect in that frequency and then to sell it commercially. And they kept going to, you know, I picture the old fashioned windows from movies, you know, where, you know, people, the person's got the, and they said, you know, not, not, not my table, you know, keep moving, you know, and, and they kept moving because they couldn't find anyone who would actually oversee that part of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. I, Jamie, I love that story. I mean, I made it up, but I, I love that, that visual because <clears throat> you've got commercial investment, not a government dollar, uh, entrepreneurs, inventors, scientists who said, geez, we can do this. And they went and did it on their own. And the government hadn't yet foreseen even the need to regulate in that spectrum. So to me, that's a great message from the market that we don't have to wait for governments to figure out what's of value. We can move to where, you know, private capital and entrepreneurial experimentation result in something that people will pay for. Mm -hmm. Now the jury's out. Uh, the jury's out. And, you know, full disclosure, I am now a member of an av the advisory board at Hawkeye 360. Uh, but we uh, and they're not the only game in town. now. There are other competitors moving into that market. So uh, I, I like the idea of the government being a second customer these days you know, versus the way, you know, we experienced it in enhanced view. That I probably can't always exist that way, but I think that's probably a sounder proposition for companies, you know, to have the commercial first and have the government be a, what's called a fast follower. Do you, I, I should, I would be remiss if I didn't plug the uh, recent aerospace report on policy setting for radio frequency collection from space. So Indeed. that's, that's out there. But um, as you think about that new and, and growing remote sensing space, if you will, and I'll call it, I'll use the term remote sensing, uh, not in the strict legal sense, as you mm -hmm. just laid out. But <clears throat> um, what do you see as the kind of risk reward balance for the U.S. national security community with that uh, emerging business area and or emerging source of technical information from space? Well, I, uh, unless I'm missing the point of your question, Jamie, I think the risk is the one I spoke to earlier that, you know, there's there's a transparency, there's a consistency, there's an unblinking eye and you need to figure out how to operate it. The reward Just away from the catcher. Yeah. The reward to me is in applications. Um, again, going back to my experience at NGA with a lot of help, uh, we, you know, made some decisions to make uh, the deep investment in data science and computer science and computer imaging, machine learning in, in the government space to complement what we were able to partner with industry and FFRDCs um, uh, like aerospace uh, to, to compete, I'll say at the back end, right? If, if pixels aren't unique, if, if access to imagery is more and more shared, if you agree with me that the job remains advantage, you have to find a different way to create it. And so it could be algorith algorithmically, it could be, um, um, you know, a, a computer vision uh, software that uh, has a higher rate of, of uh, 
you know, um, accuracy and, and, or shortens timelines in a way that allows you or more importantly, that person that you serve to know something a little bit sooner. So I find, I find that the reward has shifted from the front to the back. And, uh, and again, I think that's where we're going to see good competition because, you know, I, I, if, if I'm still the director of NGA, you know, my, my value proposition is around, you know, transporter, elector, uh, erector, launcher identification in terrain intensive, you know, peninsulas around the world. Well, uh, you know, Starbucks is interested in trying to get more people, you know, into their coffee shops and procuring um, their products. That's a different kind of end use, but I think there's a lot of overlap with respect to how you how you understand movements and how you create insight to to create whatever your your value proposition is. You've uh, you raised a really um, interesting issue with regard to sort of sources of innovation and ingenuity and uh, new applications. Um, if I can do just a moment of, of navel gazing here, uh, in the in World War II and in the early days of the Cold War, the um, the nation created these FFRDCs, the federally funded research and development centers, to really uh, drive technological development in areas mostly relevant to national security, uh, nuclear energy radar, space, uh, operations analysis. Um, in a world where the commercial vendors are doing more of the tech development on their own, um, not in direct response to a government directed spec, do you see a need for a change in the role of the uh, FFRDC community, one that's more about making sense of things and being a kind of clear eyed uh, assessor of things as opposed to uh, maybe the early stage tech developer? Or is that is a balance shifting there? Um, I, I don't know, Jamie, how much I can add here. I'm one. Uh, and I'm not just saying this because I'm on your show right now, but I've always been a big fan of the partners in the FFRDCs. And I always felt that they were an extension uh, of deep expertise, access, and, and I'll say innovation because it, they had a bridging role. Um, mm. And to me, I always, I found myself relying upon um, uh, aerospace ran biter, uh, to be a place where, um, I could quickly gain access to that, that set of expertise and, and I could quickly gain objectivity. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the, and again, look, I, 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 I've spoken to my appreciation for markets, but in this case, it's nice to have someone who's not selling me something in the room. Um, I think that's going to be all the more important. I would argue that as the market becomes, you know, more turbulent and I, turbulent in a good way and, you know, companies rise and fall and, and, and combine and merge, um, compete and cooperate that I think the the myriad possibilities of government in our in a reaction with them, I think is going to be a greater demand signal to have that objective expert uh, input. Um, so to me, I think the role is um, and maybe this is good to your question, Jamie, again, maybe this is the shift. Maybe the shift is going to be less, you know, I'll call it bespoke technical development in an FFRDC because of the commercial capability and more of a brokerage, more of a advocacy and um, a consultancy kind of relationship. 
uh, than it was. Mm -hmm. But, you know, maybe it's just a shift of emphasis within those two fields. That's an interesting question, you know, and uh, certainly one that shapes these uh, national assets in the in the long term. It's going to build the right expertise and, and maintain it and apply it to the hardest problems uh, where that independence is critical. So we're coming toward the end of our uh, our window of time here. Unfortunately, there's so much more to discuss, but the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has just rolled out these new regulations. We've talked about them a little bit. What do you see as the next step? I mean, they're just now uh, really laying out what they've met with them and explaining it. The Advisory Committee on Commercial Remote Sensing is meeting to uh, review it. But where do you see things going next? From a regulatory point of view? That's right. Huh. Um, I hadn't thought about it. I was so excited about the recent change. Uh, I was taking a break. But um, look, I, like I said, I was very pleasantly surprised with the changes that were rolled out. Uh, I do think it's the right shift of mindset. Look, I, I think we're going to move towards eventually um, – I think you're going to see a continuing lessening, lessening of the regulation and licensing, I'll say, on the left end, so the mm -hmm. input end of the equation. And I think we need to have more discussions about the right end. Um, the algorithms, I, the applications downstream. I, I do, and, and I know we're coming to a close, mm -hmm. Jamie, so maybe uh, we'll think about a part two, but uh, don't want to open up a whole new subject. But but let's face it, uh, there are real issues to deal with on privacy and civil liberties on the right end. Who has access to that data? How can it be used for or against me? Uh, where is it held? How is it protected? Those are, that's where I think we need to shift our attention um, because uh, there are real issues in there with respect to um, issues that we hold dear as Americans. You know, we, mm. we we value our markets, we value our innovative capability, and we value our privacy. And I want the government, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of the schism. You know, when we go to bed at night, or I'll say for myself, when I go to bed at night, I want to make sure the government's protecting me. Uh, when I wake up in the morning and I grab my smartphone, I go, uh-oh, what's the government doing on my smartphone? You know, so it's like same government, different time of day, but, you know, is it is it is it for me or against me? And, and that's... Look, that's, I think, the American experience. We always have that tension. But I think as the data becomes more prevalent, as these sensors become more ubiquitous, and again, we're having this debate around facial recognition now, um, I think we need to elevate the conversation about the protections uh, on the far end. So um, hopefully they'll move out of the NOAA sphere, uh, NOAA sphere, uh, and into, you know, the Department of Justice and, uh, you know, conversations with you know, American Civil Liberties Union, et cetera, to have to, to find where the right line is for that access on the other end. We don't, we don't make it illegal to uh, build or own a shovel, but it is illegal to hit somebody over the head with it. And uh, it's even illegal to threaten somebody to hit them over the head with it. The, um, so yeah, maybe we're moving into something that's more akin to that rather than uh, regulating the possession and manufacture of shovels. The, this has been a really enlightening conversation, Robert, and appreciate your uh, years of public service and the wisdom you're continuing to bring to these issues. It's, uh, it's been great having you on the show. We really look forward to continuing the conversation and hope, uh, yeah, hope to have you back sometime soon. Thanks very pleasure. much. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Thank you so much for being on our show today. We really appreciate it. That was a very interesting dialogue about remote sensing. As always, find us on Twitter. We're at hashtag the Space Policy Show. Ask the questions in the video comment box below. You can also sign up for our latest news alerts at aerospace.org slash policy. And until next time, take care. <laughs>